Darkness falls. Unstable order fractures to chaos. Fear reigns. Our numbers few. Our chances slim. Some fall prey to the very ideals we oppose. Our support seems thin, but we are not left behind. We commit to something that is greater than us. We believe in what could be. We do not accept what is. Our cause is just. Our message is certain. Our truth is absolute. This is not a prison sentence. It is freedom for us, for you, for them. Will you accept the call? Will you believe? Will you join us? We move one step at a time behind enemy lines. All right, how's everybody doing today? Yeah, all right, go ahead and give me some applause, right? Because I'm. Thank you. At Northport, I know they're giving me a standing ovation right now because I wore my business suit. Because how many know when you're behind enemy lines, it's got to be business, baby, right? It's got to be business. So I've got my boots on, I've got my jeans on just in case I need to get a little dirty, but I got my, I'm all business up top, I'm all work down bottom. Right? I don't know what that means, but I just said it. All right? So here's what I want you to do. We're going to end this series this weekend of Behind Enemy Lines. Let me tell you where this started and why it's so important as we have uh, worshiped the Lord today and, and talked about praising God, His amazing grace. And man, I hope that you sense that today. I hope that uh, that amazing grace is alive to you because here's what I know. For many of us, it is alive, but sometimes we just lose the fire of it. Anybody with me? You ever sung that song and you really kind of, uh, you just kind of going through the motions or you sung the old hymn? And, and here's what I want you to do. Before you leave today, I want you to feel the importance of I need to focus on God's amazing grace, especially when we're living in a time behind enemy lines, right? And we went on to talk about we can broaden the depth of our relationship with God. We can expand our borders, our faith. And how many feel like your faith is small some days? Man, me, I, you know, uh, the la I, 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 we have been doing this series on, on the war that we're, people are not the enemy, but Satan's the enemy. And anytime you call Satan out, turn to somebody and go, uh-oh. It's on. And, and so, you know, one thing I can say is I've had horrific problems with my back since anniversary service. But how many know God is faithful? My Ironman brothers prayed for me Tuesday night, and I have been on the upswing, getting better ever since then. And today, I stand on the stage for the first time in a long time, actually pain-free uh, since two weeks. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for that. So I am excited about that. Uh, and I'm just still stoked about the anniversary service weekend. But I got to tell you, that weekend, uh, you know, we had this picture opportunity. And, and so uh, we, we called everybody together. Our whole family was there. Hannah was with us. Good to have Hannah with us today. And uh, so we took a picture. But we've got one in the family when it comes to pictures. And we know what I'm talking about. So did we get, we have, some, we have some slides for you, hopefully. I'm going to show you this picture. Take a look at the screen and look at, this is my little boy. Uh, Luke is coming, it's coming down. <laughs> now, Luke, I, I'm going to let some pictures just roll through here. Luke's that guy, you tell him to smile. I love Luke. He's full of energy. He's like, there's something about picture time, you know, or uh, this is a, a, a expanded family picture. Next one, guys, you know, there's our anniversary service. Sweet 16 right there. How many parents have ever experienced that? Or how many have been with someone, your boyfriend or girlfriend, you want to take a good picture, you're all excited, and you get, come on, everybody, let's get a picture, and there's always one goofball. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're like, come on. Or somebody blinks. How many close your eyes? Every picture. That's me, man, always closing my eyes. And so what do you do when your kid's not cooperating? You take them outside. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? How many parents have done that? You like, like get mean with your kid to get them to smile for a picture. 
right? Come on! You, you know, and you're trying to put on a good face with everybody around, sweet 16th service. And Sarah, you, you know when Sarah is getting frustrated because her mouth doesn't open anymore. Her teeth clench like a pit bull. <laughs> Austin, right now, you better get in here. Stand up, stand up, right? Jaw muscles tensed up. Here's what I know, man. You know, the more you try to pressure that person into doing that thing, how many know the less likely they are to enjoy it? In this last message of Behind Enemy Lines, how many times do we live in frustration in our world today when we see people living out of God's will? I got to tell you, it is so frustrating to me. And as a young Christian, I was on fire for God, man. God had saved me out of my sin. I was that bad dude. I was the guy who played church, you know, but really in my heart, I was not there. And, and when I received Jesus, man, I received the fire. To, and here's, here's, God called me to save the world. I'm Jesus. I thought I was Jesus. If not Jesus, I was surely thought I was the Holy Spirit. Anybody with me right there? Why are you drinking that? You can't drink that. Why are you seeing that movie? You can't go to that movie. You need to stop using that language. You, you, you are, you're going to hell. Right? That fire in us, you're like, come on, man, you need Jesus. What's wrong with you? Why would you? You're, having, you're not having fun in sin. You're not having fun. I know you're not having, they're looking at me like, what is wrong with you? I'm having a great time. We're trying to get them in the family picture. We're trying to get them in the family because we know the family's the best place to be. And we are pressuring them. And today when you watch, you know, we got an election coming up. How many know the election's right around the corner? You need to vote. How many are a little frustrated? How many are a little scared? Don't raise your hand. And, 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 you know, how many of us talk to the TV when we see the news? Man, I started reading a little news lately, and I'm like, I got to stop this. Because my blood pressure's going up. And here's the deal. Those news anchors cannot hear me. Those bloggers cannot hear me. And if I was in the room with them, they would not listen to me. So the question becomes, what do I do in a world when we see people living out of God's will? When we want them to be blessed, we really do. At the core of our desire to change the world is a good, good, good spirit. But Satan takes that and Christians that are on fire for God and he turns us into these crazy, weird people. We, we see the country going to hell in a handbasket. And we want to help them see the errors of their ways. And so we must be the mouthpiece of conviction in our society, at our work, when people are driving. Let me tell you something about this approach to people. You see, I want to remind you what we've talked about the last few weeks. This is very important. People are not the enemy. Say that with me. People are not the enemy. Here's what Larry Osborne says in his book, Thriving in Babylon. Our great assignment is to go into all the world and recruit what, guys? Jesus followers. Teaching them to obey everything Jesus taught us. Jesus never told us. Now, I got my boots on tonight because I'm going to step on your toes if you're a believer, okay? Jesus never told us. Everybody pull their chairs, their feet under their chairs right now. In Northport online, just pull them under the chairs, okay? Jesus never told us to create a Christian nation. It's not, it's not in, the, in the scriptures. He never told us to impose our standards on non-believers. Christians are not called to impose their standards on non-believers. Christians are not called to preserve a particular culture. Now, I wrestle with this. When I read with this in this book, it messes with me because I love my country. I love my Christian heritage. I love all that God used to bless this nation. God bless America. How many love that on our coins, man? The motto, one nation under God. And how many believe that a lot of people don't believe that? Does that make you mad? Makes me mad when people try to take the God out of the pledge. I want to slap them into Christianity, baby. <laughs> Come on. Anybody besides me? Come on. I get angry. I get upset when people are taking God's name in vain. When, when I see our culture turning its back 
on all things God. And we watch the, in my lifetime, watch prayer go out of schools. We watch the Word of God go out of schools. I remember reading Psalm 1 every day in sixth grade. Many of you heard me say that. And I think that was an amazing foundation. But here's the hard part for Steve Glover and for at least one person in this room in, this, this, uh, in our campuses this weekend. God has not called us to make America a Christian nation. God has called us for one mission. You see, he told us to do what, guys? He told us to win over the lost. Your mission as the special forces of the army of God, because we're living behind enemy lines, is to one thing, one thing. Turn to somebody and go, one thing, baby. One thing, to win the lost. At any cost, we used to say, the old church phrase. To win the lost at any cost. But, but Steve, what about discipleship? You know what discipleship is? It's you growing in Christ so that you can reflect God. That's called glorifying God so that people can see who God is. And if Jesus is lifted up, he will do what? He will draw all men and women to him. But see, rather than lift Jesus up, I'd rather beat them with the cross. This is good preaching, for me at least. In your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to see something profound to end this series. And my prayer this weekend is that God would burn this in your heart. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament to write things on the tablets of our heart. They literally would put scriptures and hang them on themselves. Some of us, man, if you're a tat person, you might need to go out tonight and get one. If you're a young person, your parents don't let you have tats, do not go get a tattoo. I'm just kidding. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. I want you to read this with me. I want us to read it loud. Everybody go there. If you don't have a Bible, pull one out from underneath the chair in front of you. 2 Corinthians 5, 11. If you don't have a Bible and you're sitting by that good-looking girl that you've always wanted to get close to, lean over and say, I need to read the Bible with you today. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 says, Since then, we know what it is, everybody, to fear the Lord We try to persuade others. Say that again. We try to persuade others. Say it again. We try to persuade others. Paul is saying, since we know what it is to fear the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is to understand his majesty and his blessings and the awesomeness of his life, and since we know and live in that, now we're going to try and what? I, I hope Northport campus is saying it louder than we did here at Punta Gorda. We're trying to do what? Persuade others to know him. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Here's what Paul was saying. When you cut through the fluff of my ministry, of my calling, of my title, of who I am, of my pedigree as a Pharisee, here's the deal. Bottom line, planet mission. Punta Gorda, Northport, Port Charlotte, Arcadia, Cape Coral. This is what we got to do. Persuade men and women, teenagers, college students, to know what it is to live in amazing grace. To know what it is to live in amazing grace. That is the mission. And here is the deal. Listen to me. If you're a Christian today... If you're a follower of Christ, if you love him, if you're upset, if you're angry, and it's okay to be angry. Anger is not a sin. It's what we do with anger that becomes a sin. If we channel that anger, write it down if you have your hand out. We are not called to pressure people to freedom, but persuade them through love. And that, my friends, is very, very hard. Because the natural response when people are doing things that are combatant to the very thing we stand for, 
when we're trying to clean our lives up and we're trying to teach our kids to live lives that are holy and set apart, and then you have people in school, people at work, people, your teachers, and I'm going to tell you, man, and my, my kids and their college professors and some of the stuff they're teaching, I get so angry, so angry. I had a college professor, actually a high school teacher, that gave an assignment to one of my kids, and this was in uh, a class, and then they had to watch a very, what I would call a very anti-Christian video that had nothing to do really to, with the subject matter of the class, and I found out about it, and I'm like, I was angry. Anybody know what I'm talking I was like, no, what? And so, I, you know, I wanted to unleash on this teacher. And God prompted me and said, hey, knucklehead old Steve, do not do that. Because that's literally like Peter who took the sword and cut the guy's ear off. And how many know when you cut someone's ear off, they're probably not going to listen to you. You're probably just going to make them more angry and they're going to draw their sword and fight back. So I wrote a very respectful letter saying how hard it is to teach today and how thankful I was that someone who's underpaid and overworked would teach my kids because I'm telling you, this, this teacher was a great teacher. Heard it by Christian students and non-Christian students alike. And so I wanted to be affirming and loving, but I was firm about we don't need these views. These are not necessary, and it challenges my son's foundation. You see... My goal was not to pressure someone, to, but to persuade them. And I, I just so used to be different from this. I, I remember when Tyler first started at what used to be Edison, now FSW, and he was taking a college class, I believe it was a humanities class, and they were studying the world uh, religions section, and they were studying the Christianity section, and in the textbook, Tyler came up to me and said, Dad, look at this right here. And the textbook said, Jesus talking about Christianity, never claimed to be the Messiah. Our textbook said that. And so I just took over my Bible and showed him the passage of the woman at the well and Jesus, where Jesus said, you've been looking for the Messiah and said, I am he. I'm like, why don't you take that and shove it up? Your no, I'm, I, 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 I did not say that. How many know I felt like saying that? Uh, no. Uh, that kind of stuff, listen, here's the problem. If that doesn't make you angry, you need to check your heart. But what you do with that anger is crucial. What you do with that energy, because you see, God gets angry. Anger is an emotion that God created. The key is to channel anger through the one which is made up of two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So what do you do? You take out your weapons, your word of God. You take out your prayer. You take out all the things that we talk about. You arm yourself with the shield of faith. You arm yourself with the helmet of salvation. You get serious about growing in your life with Christ. We are not called to pressure. Guys, say that. We are not called to pressure people, but to what? But to persuade them through love. Acts 18, if you want to flip back with me. Acts chapter 18. This is a beautiful picture of where Paul was now, uh, he left Athens and was going to Corinth. Remember, the Roman Empire was not a Christian place to live. It was a decadent, evil, sex orgy filled, lawless, rape, murder time. It was, there was multiple gods and worship. It was a crazy, crazy time. And here's the deal. Rome, in the time the Bible was written, the book of Acts, tolerated every religion except for how many ever watch the news and you go, 
that religion believes the same way we do about this issue, yet you don't hear anything negative about that religion. But Christianity, do, 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 do. Can I tell you sort of reasonably and logically why that exists? It's because back in the early 1900s, when evolution came on the scene, and we started debating that, there was a court trial. It's called the, the Scopes Monkey Trial. Many of you know this, state of Tennessee. And we, as Christians, won that trial, but we lost in the court of public opinion. And then we saw this fracturing of the church and society where the church began to isolate itself and the church began to rage and be angry and talk about how secular things, secular marketplace, secular music, secular dancing, and there begin to be this distinct separation. And we see this thing, Sandy, if you can come help me set up the, the barricades. We see this thing begin to develop in churches that became the way of Christianity for the next hundred years. And it went this, Robert, I need you and Anita, come up here. I want you to stand right here like you're trying to get into a good club right there. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the club guy. I need a couple more people. Come on up here. Uh, just a little brandy. Come on, line up. You got to get in single file with your cover charge. Get ready to get in the club, <laughs> right? You want to get in? Uh, can you stop cussing? Just go with me. Say yes or no. I don't care. Uh, can, you going to clean your life up? You going to act like me? All right. Come on in. Come on in. You're in. You're in. Right here. But you better act right, Robert. All right. All right. So here we go. All right. So Robert's in because he's acting. He's, he's fulfilling this, 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 this. All the Christian things. Need to come on up here. So uh, you're going to be able to, uh, you're going to be able to get your temper under control? I heard what you, how you talked to Sandy. It not. Okay. So <laughs> you're not going to be able to do that? You're not going to be that kind of wife? Here. Go, go home. Just go home. Go home. You're not in. You're not in. Randy, what, what's up, man? What's up? Hey, you gonna go to church every Sunday? Yes. All right. You you going to uh, you going to uh, you gonna you gonna give tithes and offerings? Yes. All right, man. Are you gonna clean your language up? Yes. You gonna stop drinking? Yes. You gonna just stop smoking? Yes. Hey, yeah, that's cool. Now, are you a proud man? Yes. yes, you are. That's okay. As long as you're not smoking and drinking, come on in. That's all right, man. Right there. <laughs> you can have a little racism in your heart. You can have a little bit, but as long as you're keeping the rules. You're in. Now, we're not anti-women. I only had one woman here tonight, so don't, don't start writing me letters. But that's what it is. Give our volunteers a big hand. Yes. Leave, it, leave that up. Thank you. So they're in. See, Paul in chapter 18 says, at, the, uh, at Corinth, he said, After this, Paul left Athens, went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, uh, Aquila uh, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. How many know Paul was a worker? He wasn't just a slacker, man. He knew how to make tents. Every Sabbath, after a hard week's work, here's what Paul did when he was in Corinth. He reasoned in the synagogue, trying to what? Persuade the Jews and the who? The Greeks. How many know the Greeks laid a foundation for much of our society today? An amazing intellectual, philosophical race and, and culture, the Greek culture. And here is Paul not trying to pressure people into thinking, acting, doing like he did, not going, hey, you bunch of stinking, immoral philosophical, pluralistic, religious sinners. Why don't you straighten up and come in? Come in. I'll let you in. I'll let you in. No. What did Paul do? He went to their place. He, now, he invited them to synagogue. But he's invited all people, and he reasoned with them. And we see Paul doing this in Athens, uh, or in the Parthenon era, area, in, where the gods were. And we see him doing this, persuading people. And why was this so important to Paul? Because Paul at one point in his ministry said, I will become all things to all people if by any means, any means I will what? Win some, save some. You see, our mission is one thing, guys, and it is to what? 
win the lost. You say, Steve, what about my own life? Again, as we grow in Christ, as we worship God, as we are discipled, now we reflect Jesus Christ. So I want to give you a scripture. If you'll turn with me, lastly, to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to get some practical application points off of this scripture as we try to win some. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. I do have it on the screen. I'll let you cheat a little bit if you want to read along there. 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 through 26. Everybody ready? Let's go. And the Lord's servant... The one who loves him, the one who serves him, totally devoted follower of Christ, must not be what? Everybody look at me. Must not be quarrelsome. That's a fancy word to say arguer. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. But must be what? Say it. Kind to Republicans, able, no, I'm sorry. Kind to Democrats, I'm sorry. Kind to what? Everyone. Man, I need an organ today. <laughs> Let's just stop there for a second. Must be kind to everyone. Must be kind to everyone. They must be able to what? Teach. Uh Uh-oh. If you're not growing in the word of God, if you're not educating yourself in the apologetics to defend your faith against evolutionary conversations, if you're not growing in the wisdom to apply the word of God through the Holy Spirit, and you're not able to teach someone... You're not fulfilling your mission as a good soldier in Jesus Christ. You are going to fail behind enemy lines. It doesn't mean you have to be a full-time teacher, teach a small group or a class, but you definitely need to be teaching someone. And your prayer should be, God, help me to be able to teach. But I'm going to teach through kindness. I am going to be not what? Resentful. Does that mess with anyone else besides me about those who don't live the way you do? I'm going to tell you, I'm a guy who gets very resentful. Here's who I really get resentful for. It's people who I call uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and those who claim to be religious, but they're not because I used to be that guy and I know how much damage it does. You see, we can't be resentful because resentment is not attractive to persuade people for Christ. Opponents. Everybody say opponents. Opponents. Opponents must be gently instructed. Opponents must be gently instructed. If you don't smile in this picture, I am going to take you out back. Maybe you can say that gently. Uh, Why is this so important? Opponents must be gently instructed. Say it with me. In hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And remember I talked about it a little bit last week. You see, Satan has taken people captive, they don't even know it, to do his will, and they're what we call POWs, prisoners of will. And they don't even know it. Most people don't actively worship consciously Satan. I am a Satanist and I want to do Satan's will. But here's the deal. If you're not for Christ, you are a captive of the will of Satan. People are not the enemy. They're just captive to the wrong side. And so we... Gently instruct our opponents in hope that the Holy Spirit, check it out, guys, the Holy Spirit will awaken them to the gospel, right? Because man cannot save himself. Only through the awakening 
of the Holy Spirit can they then go, I need Jesus. The blindness comes off. I need Jesus. And now with the will that God has given mankind, they say to him, yes, or they say to the Holy Spirit, no. They will come to their senses, escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. What do we do to accomplish this mission? I'm going to give you three quick points. One, number one, guys, you need to show respect even in a disagreement. Here's the cool thing about this. Put this in your marriage. Put this in your parenting. Put this in your friendships. Put this at school with your friends, with your teachers, with your mom and dad. This is a Christian thing. Show respect even in disagreement. Now, what I know and what I wrestle with when I put this statement was, yes, some people don't deserve respect. Respect is earned. I understand all that, but here's what you need to know. Those people are prisoners of the will of Satan. And what they are doing, they do not see the end result. And we need to pray against that, that God will open their eyes. So even when they disagree with us, and i got to tell you, if you've never watched or listened to Ravi Zacharias talk to those who disagree with him, you want to know how to do that? Go watch him. He can do it in a way. And Ravi says this, you can have a debate, a loving, gentle, respectful debate with someone who thinks you're foolish and an idiot for believing the way you do, but you should treat them in a way that at the end of that debate, you can go over and put your arm around them and say, I love you and I'm praying for you. God help Steve to be that way. Show respect even in disagreement. Number one. Number two, guys, be kind to almost everyone. How many of that would do it for you right there? Yes, yes. God, grant me an amendment to the word of God so I can, that ain't going to happen. It's never, never changing. Some of you need to just say this to yourself right now. Say your name and then say the statement. Steve, be kind to everyone. Say it, do it right now. Say it. Rick, say it. Robert, say it. Sandy, come on. Be kind. Now what I want you to do is visualize that person you do not want to be kind to. Tell right now. Visualize them. Oh, I see you. Some people are smiling. Some people are like clenching their teeth like Sarah. I'm just kidding, babe. Here's what God showed me about kind words. Every kind word, especially to a person that disagrees with you, that dislikes you, maybe even hates you. Every kind word is one piece of the bridge to the heart and mind of those who do not yet believe the way we do. So every time you want to be mean, and maybe they deserve meanness, think of this as one steel beam, one board, one nail, one bolt, where you're building a bridge And God is going to use you in that kind word. The Bible says when you speak blessings, when you pray for your enemies, it is like coals dumped on their head. When you, someone (laughs) expects you to respond negatively to them, and then you go, you know what, man? I respect your views, and you know what? I think our conversation's done. And by the way, have a great day. In fact, here's 10 bucks on me. Go buy, go buy your, go buy lunch or something, man. That's cool. How many of you are going to perplex your opponents? They're going to go, those Christians, they're as insane as I thought they were. <laughs> Brad Paisley has a song called Crazy Christians. You need to go home and listen to that. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. You see, respect, kindness, and gentleness. It screams, it screams love. Show respect even in disagreement, be kind to everyone. And then the last point, because I think I deleted it on my notes, guys. It's on the screen. Can you put that up there for me, guys? I'm going to read it. Be gentle in your approach to build trust. Turn to somebody and go, gentle, baby. Be gentle in your approach to build trust. All right. So how many have ever uh, ran or done something crazy when you're meeting a mean dog for the first time? And you regretted it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
If you know how to approach a dog for the first time, what do you do? You hold your hand out, right? You want to open that palm up. You, you want to let them smell you, right? We want to approach them gently. We don't want to move fast. We, we want to move slow. We want to speak nice to them. And hopefully they will not snap at us. And it's the same way with people who disagree with us, guys. You see, we need to be gentle to people. And one thing I find a lot of, in a lot of my lifetime experiences, Christians can be some of the most harsh people I know. And guys, listen, if God calls you to a street corner to hold up a sign that says, repent or you're going to burn in hell, can I just say this? Can you please make sure that's God? Because here's what we know. If people do not repent, they will be lost. But how effective is it for you when you have no relationship with someone, when you don't know what they're going through, where they're at, you're really not interested in their life, you go out on a street corner and are holding up something that's telling people something that is so mean-spirited. And guys, again, I'm not a guy that says every person that does that's bad or anything like that. I know there are some people called to be confrontational evangelists, and sometimes people are ready, and they need to hear that message right then. But here's what we know, factually based. Rarely do people come to know Jesus that way. Rarely do they come. People come to know Jesus primarily through some close relationship. Then that person, that close, close relationship either tells them about Christ, invites them to a gifted preacher or teacher or small group or those kind of things. And how many know it's all about a process of building that relationship? Amen to that. Here's what we know. In turn, being disrespectful, rude, and harsh is a sure way to create walls. And it's a sure way to put up what, guys? A barricade. Now, I'm going to hit a sensitive, sensitive uh, political subject now, Oops, how do I do that too often we as Christians and we're getting ready to close now we love to put up walls or fences or barricades because then we can see who's in and who's what who's out who's a believer and who's a sinner and there are sinners and there are believers but as I was reading this little booklet that says, how do you know if you're really saved? I read this cool story. And I want to tell you a story. There's a guy in our church. Uh, his name is Arnie. And he has a ministry. And he dig, what, digs wells. Uh, and it's, it's called, is it, is it Wells for Life? I think it's Wells for Life. And it's over in uh, Zambia, I believe. Is that right? It's in Africa. Everybody say Africa. I'll, I'll get my facts straight. Uh, but here's the deal. He digs wells. I, I, he has dug thousands of wells for a nation where they're so short of drinking water and they have to walk miles, uh, mostly women and children, to get clean drinking water. And what often happens, he tells, tells this story in our Ironman group, is that the women will walk to the wells and there will be thugs and robbers and those women will get repeatedly beaten and raped because they are victims of a messed up culture and society and all because they don't have clean drinking water they carry these huge things of water miles a few times a day and what Arnie God put on his heart a successful businessman was that he went in and began to research changed his life around late 40s God just did a work on him I'm going to have him give his testimony one day here and he began he, he, he got a group of people together and he began to dig wells and the cool thing was that he, he told us in our men the night he did his presentation that, Steve, these, these women and these children were walking all those miles when the water for life was just a few feet down below them. And all they needed someone to do was to come and dig a well. And what they do is they buy and dig these wells and they plant a church everywhere they dig these wells because people come to the wells. In Australia, in the inner city, inner areas of Australia, where the cattle ranchers ranch, you see 
there's two ways to keep their cattle in. Some try to build fences, but the most effective way that Australian cattle ranchers keep their cattle is to dig a well. And you see the cows, out of their thirst for the true water of life, stay close to that well. Here's your last point today. You see, Jesus is calling Christians to build wells, not walls. So crazy as John Ortberg explores this thing about salvation, he said the crazy thing about Jesus, and we're done, is that Jesus never focused on who was out. He was all about calling people in. Jesus was about this, Randy. Come to me, all you who are heavy laden, who are tired, who are weary, who are broken, who are captive, who are sick. He said, I don't care that you got leprosy. I don't care that you're laying naked in the street and you just committed adultery. I don't care that you've had five husbands. I don't care that you are this or that. Come to me. And what if we Christians would quit looking here and start looking out there? What if we would stop building walls and start building wells? Let me ask you a question. Is your life a well? Are people that are thirsty, that are broken, because everybody in sin will get there, are they seeing gentleness and kindness? Are they seeing respect because you really do love them? You see, that, my friends, is what we were made for. Bridges of love not barricades of hate. Watch this video. We're going to close with a song. Guys, thank you for listening. When's it going to happen? Here I am. There you are. Here I am, desperate for love, for truth. What are you going to do when you leave this building? Are you going to share with me what you've been learning here today? Or are you just going to bottle it up and pull it out next week for your friends. Now when I say share, I'm not talking about every tactic you've used on me in the past, like judging my every move, telling me I'm a bad person, pointing fingers, giving me disgusting looks. <laughs> and my favorite is when you tell me that I'm lost. I don't even know what that means to be lost. Do you really think judging me is going to make me change? Would it make you change? Now, I, I know I'm a bad person. I've, I've done bad things. But I don't need you to tell me that. What I need is for you to pick me up when I fall down, to be there when I'm broken. Yes, there's, there's something missing in me. There's a void in my heart that I don't know how to fill. You have it. You have that thing that makes you whole. You know that person that I need to know. So I'm watching your every move. I'm watching where you go and what you say and do. Because I'm desperate for something real. I need something genuine to know that there's something more here than this. I mean, this, this can't be it, really. And I think you know that. Listen to me. I need you. I need you to be here for me. I need you to walk out right now, ready and willing to do whatever it takes. Hey, it's, it may not be comfortable. It may not be easy. But I need you to show me love. No matter the cost, show me what unconditional love really looks like. Stop telling me about this God of yours and show me who he really is. Honestly, I'll probably resist you. I'll probably argue with you and laugh at you. I'll, you know, even when you fall, I'll probably call you a hypocrite. But don't give up on me.
please don't give up on me. So I'm going to ask you, when's it going to happen? <laughs>